Steve Cheney, the CEO of the American Security Project, and welcome to our continuing series on the defense budget. For those not familiar with the American Security Project, we were founded in 2005 by Senators Hagel, Kerry, Hart, and Rudman, and the intent was to have an educational institution that would discuss topical issues from a defense or national security perspective. Our board is comprised of Republicans, Democrats, businessmen and women, and seven retired generals and admirals. <coughs> Let me talk for a little minute here about the ground rules for today. We are, of course, on the record as being broadcast by C-SPAN. Uh, we'll be on Twitter. We've got a hashtag. Uh, we'll record it and then put it up on our website this afternoon. Following my introduction, Dr. Corp will have his remarks, probably 15 or 20 minutes or so. Uh, then we'll have maybe a short dialogue between the two of us. Then I'll open it up to Q&A. On the Q&A, we have a roving microphone, so uh, if you wait till I call on you, get the microphone, please stand, introduce yourself shortly, and have a very short question, and then we'll end promptly at 1.30. Uh, today's topic is Defense Budget Issues 2015, and it certainly is an interesting time for the defense budget. Finally, we might even have one. Uh, as you know, the administration is set to send its 2015 budget request to Congress on March 4th. And Secretary Hagel is going to preview the Pentagon's portion on February 24th. And the QDR is due out this week. The cap for 2015 for the Pentagon should be around $521 billion, give or take. And who knows what the OCO or Overseas Contingency Operations Funding request is going to be for. Uh, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that this amount is less than ideal in the Pentagon's eyes. Reductions have to occur. The question is where and why. And we're here to discuss these issues. And I've got Dr. Dr. Larry Korb from the Center for American Progress. Now, Dr. Korb has a long resume. Larry, I won't read the whole thing. But he's formerly been with the Council on Foreign Relations, Brookings Institution, University of Pittsburgh, Raytheon, and the American Enterprise Institute. His government service has included being the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Manpower, Reserve Affairs, Installations, and Logistics from 1981 to 1985. But in my opinion, just as significant was his duty in the United States Navy flying P-2s and P-3s. He is a Vietnam veteran and a retired Navy captain. So Larry, we look forward to your comments. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Captain Larry Corbin. Is it on, uh, Matthew? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General, for that very kind uh, uh, introduction. Uh, you know, when you talk about the defense budget, people say to me, well, you know, why are you so interested? I've been doing this you know, since I wrote my dissertation in the late, uh, late 60s, because in defense, dollars are policy. If you don't get the money, you can't do it. Planning becomes uh, irrelevant and operations impossible. So it is very, very, very important that we do it and, and, we, uh, and we do it correctly. The other thing is that the decisions we make now <clears throat> are going to have a profound impact. How long is an aircraft carrier, you know, last? And, you know, one of the things about uh, politics <clears throat> is that a lot of times <clears throat> a president will make decisions and the next president, you know, he and hopefully someday soon she will, you know, benefit, uh, you know, from them. Uh, recently at the uh, center, uh, we had uh, Harold Brown there, and he was Jimmy Carter's Secretary of, <clears throat> of Defense, and he's put out a book. Unlike uh, the most immediate secretary, he waited, you know, quite a few years to put his book out. But, you know, in there, you take a look and you say, look at all the things he did. But Carter didn't get credit for him when we came in in the Reagan administration. We bought the stuff, but basically they had developed, uh, developed all of that. In fact, after the first Gulf War, uh, you may remember then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney called President Reagan and said, you know, you, we owe you a big you know, debt for all that you did and the smart bombs and everything that we were able to use. And uh, a reporter from the Wall Street Journal called me and said, well, you must feel pretty good in the Reagan administration. I said, yeah, but you should have called Carter as well. He said, Jimmy Carter? I said, yeah, he developed all those te technologies, so it is important it does create policy and has tremendous long-term uh, impacts. So where are we? Okay, well, we got a pretty good idea of how much the, uh, the money is. Uh, 
is it's been a partial relief from sequestration, <clears throat> but it's not as high as it was in uh, F fiscal year 2010. It's been coming down uh, since then in real terms. But if you take a look at it in historical terms, it's pretty darn good. Because if you look at the Cold War average, you know, it was basically about $450 billion. And if you look at some of the other downturns that we've had, for example, after Korea, after Vietnam, and after the end of the Cold War, those downturns were about $100 billion less. In fact, I'm talking in you know, real dollars than you, uh, than you are now. So the amount of money is really not a problem. And I think all things considered, given our debt problems and, and, and everything else, <clears throat> that the Pentagon has enough money. Now, <clears throat> the general mentioned you know, the OCO account. Now, if any of you have ever been, as they say, in the building or done budgeting, you know that when you have a supplemental, you can do a lot of things there to, uh, you know, to take care of things that really don't belong there, but it never gets the, you know, the attention that it should. I remember once I was at a town hall meeting with my uh, congressman, Jim Moran, who was uh, serving his last term, and we were talking about Iran. And a woman got up in the, in the thing and she said, my son's in Afghanistan and you haven't passed that supplemental yet, you know, he's, you know, I'm worried about him. And, and Moran sort of said, we just got it yesterday. She said, well, you know, you get it, uh, get it done. And then, of course, so it doesn't get the scrutiny. And we know things <clears throat> that have been in there like missile defense, for example, routine personnel costs that people have been able, you know, to, to do it. I mean, if you take a look at the OCO account last year, it hardly came down. We cut the number of troops in Afghanistan in half. But so there was a lot of things. So in terms of money, they're OK. Now, <clears throat> within the, the budget, you have to make a number of, I think, important decisions. And <clears throat> you see uh, <clears throat> all, all about. Let me turn to the first one, which is nuclear weapons. <clears throat> now, we're on the threshold of having to modernize all three legs of the triad right now. And the real question is, you want to stay with the new start limits? Are you willing to? do that, you're going to have to build a new uh, generation of, uh, of, of ballistic missile submarines, a new bomber, and then, of course, modernize your, your land-based land missiles. Now, according to the Congressional Budget Office, if you do it the way the services want, that's going to cost you $360 billion. Now, in my view, I don't think you need to do that. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, you've got to keep to the start limits. We can't trust the, the Russians. But really, we could go down to 1,000 right now. And i, I got to tell you, having worked in President Obama's campaign, I do remember this was a big issue, the nuclear weapons. And you remember his speech in Prague and everything. And I think he would really like to. And I'm hoping that in this budget he says, OK, look, you know, we can go down, so we're not going to have to modernize all three legs of the triad. We're not going to have to build 12 you know, uh, new uh, submarines. and and. and and, and use that as a way to uh, keep with uh, keep within the budget. If you don't, then of course you know you're going to have to be spending that a long time. Now you know one of the the problems with the whole nuclear thing is a lot of people say, oh, they're not that expensive. You may remember at Ash Carter, then the deputy was out at uh, Aspen this year and giving a speech, uh, and you know, he said, oh, they're not that expensive. Well, yeah, but they're still. I mean, if you count everything. They're at least $30 billion a year. And of course, part of it's in the, uh, <clears throat> the energy budget. Now, a lot of people wonder, well, why is that over there? Well, Eisenhower didn't trust people like fill in the blank, Curtis LeMay, you know, who were going to be using these things to be developing. So he then put it in, was then the Atomic Energy Commission. So when you take a look, it's, it's a pretty good amount of money. But that's, a, you know, that's, a, a, I think, something that they're going to have to have to be dealt with. The next issue basically is going to be the active reserve mix, uh, and particularly with the Army. <clears throat> uh, you saw what happened last year when the Air Force tried to uh, <clears throat> you know, end the A-10s and you know, take a lot of those out of the, the Air Guard. There was a big uproar from the, uh, uh, from, from the Congress. But I think the real key issue is going to be the Army, uh, because they are the most manpower intensive of the services. And the army got up to about 570,000 during the you know the height of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're targeted to go down to 490,000. Um, people have talked about whether they can 
you know, go lower. My personal view is, given how well the Guard and Reserve performed, and none of us knew that they would do so well in Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan, that you can go lower, in, in, I would say as low as about 420,000. Now, is there a risk? Yes, there's always a risk. In fact, every time, you know, people say, well, you know, anything could happen. You can't buy perfect security. You could spend the whole federal budget on defense that you're not. Is there a risk? But it's a manageable risk because it's hard for me to conceive of us getting involved in a large land, uh, you know, war again any, any time soon. And as I say, we now know we could call up the Guard and Reserve if, and remember Bob Gates' speech at West Point, that his secretary recommends that should have, you know, his or her head examined. Well, the fact of the matter is I think we have, you know, we, we moved, moved away from that. And the emphasis is going to be on drones. It's going to be on uh, on special forces in terms of the way that we're we're going we're go going to do things. But that's going to be a very big issue. Now the army is arguing, and, and General Odier now, and he said, "Well, we've done this before, and you know, we we were never prepared." And there's no doubt about it. That's why I say you can't buy perfect security, but you have to look out and say, "Well, you know, what is the most likely time that we're you know going to use forces?" And uh, are we going to have the large, uh, large land on? The Marines have a similar issue. You know, they want to stay at 175. I think you could probably go down to 150. Uh, they won't like it. But again, nonetheless, you have the Marine Corps Reserve. And if you did need to get involved, you, know, you would want to call them up. And the Marines are transitioning themselves away, you know, back to their traditional, uh, traditional <coughs> of the you know, small forces going in rapid, uh, 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 rapidly. So that's it. Now, one of the things, the reason you need to do that is because we can't do anything about military compensation. You have just seen, in my view, a disgraceful episode about what happened. Because when you had the budget agreement crafted by Senator Murray and uh, 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 Congressman Ryan to basically, among other things, get the Pentagon relief from sequestration, put some more money back into the budget, one of the things they said is, okay, for working age retirees, you're going to get 1% less than the cost of living until you're 62, then we'll recompute it. Well, you had think we had said we were going to abolish the, you know, the, the military or something, and all of the, you know, the to do about that, and the 20 veterans lobbies came out. And why I think it, it, it really is a, a, a bad omen. Everybody knows we've had to do something about our military pay and benefits. You know, they keep rising as a share of the budget, and if the budget is going to come down, at least in real terms, and they keep going up, you're going to have, uh, you know, something has got to, uh, has got to give. And what I <clears throat> thought this was significant was that the initiative came from Congress, because go back, read Rumsfeld, <clears throat> okay, Gates, Panetta, okay, Hagel have all said we got to do something, and Congress wouldn't do anything. And so, therefore, when Congress takes the lead, and not only did you have Chairman Ryan, okay who's obviously a rising star, he has run for vice president, and I'm sure someday he's going to be a presidential candidate, backed up by Adam Smith, who's the ranking member on armed services. Okay, stepping up and saying, you know, we got to, and we didn't. And so, basically, I said, well, we'll wait till the commission comes out. Well, read Bull Simpson or anything else you want to, the commission, but if that comes out in February, of 2015, and then of course you've already got your 16 budget done, and you know then you're into uh, you know uh, 2017 when you get a you know a new a new administration. But that's something that has to be dealt with. One of the reasons, and you may remember that Chuck Hagel had a shall we say interesting confirmation uh, process, is when folk, <laughs> some of his people call me and ask me to you know do some press calls and write some stuff. One of the things I thought that would be great about him is having been an enlisted man in Vietnam, he would have credibility in taking on some of these issues. He did make the proposals, but they didn't get any place. And then uh, when the, uh, I'll call it the smith Ryan proposal uh, uh, came up, the Pentagon backed off, Christina Fox and Admiral Winfield backed off, and even Hagel seemed to change his mind. The administration said, 
Well, we'll, we, we'll grandfather it. Come on, 2034, you're going to start? No, you've got to, you've got to do it. So that, I think, is, is also uh, an issue we're going to have to, uh, have to deal with in this, uh, in this budget. Uh, the next thing, obviously, is the whole question of procurement. I don't know how many of you saw 60 Minutes on Sunday night, and you saw, you know, the the F-35, and, and you know, one of the bottom lines on this was well, too big to cancel. We don't have anything else, even though it's causing all kinds of problems. Well, you do have some alternatives that you can use. For example, there's no reason why the Navy should have to buy this darn thing. Okay, the F-18 E and F's, the Super Hornets, uh, you can get them for about one third the cost. And given the, you know the likely missions of the uh, of the Navy, I think uh, that uh, this you know would be, be more 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 than more than adequate. You've got to go ahead with the uh, Air Force version. You're too far down. But what this typifies to me is when the budget was going up as it did between 2001, actually it starts in 1998 to 2010. People don't manage the way that they should. You know, I was talking to the general at lunch today, and I've gone back and looked. When did the Pentagon really run well, okay, in terms of um, acquisition uh, type of thing? It's when you had a strong Deputy Secretary of Defense, David Packard, okay? Charlie Duncan, who was the president of Coca-Cola, Don Atwood from General Motors. When those people were in there, it ran well. And interestingly enough, when they were there, the budgets weren't going up, they were going down. And they were able to uh, able able to uh, to do it and manage the process. You know, last April, John McCain wrote an article in Foreign Policy, and one of the things he said was sequestration, sequestration in fact, has been caused by how poorly we manage the weapons. And he mentioned, you know, all of the ones that have been canceled. <clears throat> you know, uh, the future combat systems and the ones that are over, you know, over cost. And his final line is, you know. Not all the cost and delivered late and everything, if delivered at all. Okay, I mean, so we really, had, and that's got to be, you know, uh, put under control uh, if you want to do things. And you're going to see, for example, uh, the LCS, the little combat ship. Uh, you know, are you going to go ahead with that, given the, the cost of, of, of that? And, and I think that will be, a, a be an issue. Which gets me to also with the Navy, number of aircraft carriers. Interesting enough, by law it says 11. The Navy wants to retire to George Washington, you know, rather than report. The real question is, do you really need that many carriers given the, if you will, the international environment and given, <clears throat> given uh, their expense and given the anti-access weapons that countries like China are, are developing, are you really going to be able to use them the way that, uh, the, the way that you want? And I think that's a... Another, another issue, again, I just know what I read in the paper, the Navy has said, and Hegel has said they'd like to go down to 10, but the White House says no, so again, uh, one of the things you, you can do if you want to, you know, record the Washington, uh, George Washington, then maybe you want to delay the next generation of, uh, of, of aircraft carrier. So you, you, have, you have, all of, uh, have all of those, uh, you know, those, uh, those missions that you have to have to deal with, and if you get it right, given you know in round numbers, I mean we're talking at least 500 billion dollars. You should be able to do it. Uh, you know, back uh, you know after the end of the Cold War and stuff, we were much lower than that. The real question: Are you going to be able to do the things that you need to? Are you going to be able to make the reductions, whether it's in personnel? whether it's uh, in the number of people, the active reserve or reserve mix, uh, to get it to, to get it right. If we don't, then obviously we'll spend a lot of money and maybe not get what we want. Let me conclude with uh, two stories here to illustrate the points I've, uh, I've been making. Uh, about these two mature ladies who were sitting in the leisure village. And one said to the other, she said, I've got news for you. She said, well, what's that? She said, I'm getting married again. She said, at your age, does he have a lot of money? Nah, just a social security. I said, is he good looking? Nah, he's just kind of average. Is she a great lover? We haven't made love. Well, why are you doing this? Because he can drive at night. <laughs> and of course, that's the thing that you can't always have the top of the line, you know, uh, weapon system that you want. 
And the other to illustrate the fact that no matter, you can't continue, every contingency, I heard this story when I was over uh, in, in Israel a while ago, and it seems that this uh, elderly couple, before they passed on, wanted to visit the Holy Land. So they went over there, and unfortunately, the husband passed away while they were there. So the rabbi came to the uh, woman, and, and he said, I'm really sorry for your loss. Uh, you have to decide if you want to bring him back home, or do you want to have him buried here? And she said, well, how much will it cost to have him buried here? And the rabbi said, no, a couple hundred dollars. How about bringing him home? He said, probably several thousand. She thought for a second, she said, I want to take him home. The rabbi said, why? It doesn't make any sense. She said, well, I heard that years ago they buried a fella here. And after three days, he rose again. I don't want to take a chance. And so, you know, in terms of the, no matter what you think, you can't plan for everything. So let me stop there. Terry, thank you. Uh, Matthew, you want to take off the uh, centerpiece here? I'm going to ask you just a couple of quick questions. Thank All you right. for your, your great remarks. Um, I'm a little worried now because I don't like driving at night. Uh, but I, I went down and I wrote down all the items that you mentioned about reductions in the, in the budget. And I'll start with the top on nuclear weapons. You may recall when New Spark came about, kind of the quid pro quo was, we'll provide modernization at the budget if you'll vote for this treaty. So the other argument on the other side has been, hey, wait a minute. You said we voted for this, and now you're telling us you want to reduce nuclear weapons and you don't want to turn on. So what's, what's your... Well, obvious, again, it, it, you know, it was amazing to me how much trouble we had getting New Start ratified. Um, because if you take a look at the previous arms control agreements, Nixon, Reagan, okay, Bush, all Republicans, they had no problem. And they were, this Cold War was still going on while we were doing these things. Now the Cold War's over, you know, people, you know, want to, to make this, uh, make this commitment. Uh, they, they did that. But again, I, I think the president should put it out there. Will it go? It'll be an interesting, an interesting debate because we really need to. And you know what I think will help the debate? got to make you know good news out of bad this nonsense going on with the uh, the, the minute man and the, the, the cheating on the tests and the lack of uh, uh, you know the feeling on the part of those folks that this is an important mission uh, I, I again you know uh, if I were Obama I'd say well read my prog speech <laughs> okay you know now I know that that people will use that you know to uh, you know to do it and they feel that they can because given quote unquote the image of uh, well, the other thing is Chuck Hagel was part of Global Zero and I, I have done a lot of work with them that doesn't mean you get rid of them all but here's another thing okay you think Henry Kissinger, Bill Perry, Sam Dunn, they all agree. I, so I think it would be an interesting debate to have. And if you said, okay, uh, you don't want to do this, you want to get the, where are you going to get the money from? Tell us, you know, where you get. Of course, you can't raise that top line now, okay, because, you know, uh, you have the quote unquote Tea Party people that, are, you know, will push you on that. Sure. But you're right. I mean, None of these things are going to be easy. I mean, look with the A-10 last year. You know, the Air Force wasn't able to uh, do that. The A-10 is older than me. And, and uh, you know, no, we, we, we still got to have it, and the guard needs it, and so on and so forth. Well, a lot of times you get into the not-in-my-backyard syndrome when they're talking about it. You talk to the Air Force bomber pilots, they say, we can get rid of the missiles. We talk about the missile airs, we don't need the bombers. Talk right. to Navy guys, you don't need any one of the others. <laughs> and then you talk to any congressman who's got one in his backyard, but yeah, I mean.